So uh, what we're going to go to now are case presentations. Um, we're going to focus on heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. And uh, Drs. Reardon and Palutla will be presenting cases. Uh, the panel will include uh, myself, Dr. Perloff, Dr. Mario Dang, as well as Dr. John Child. We also uh, very much encourage input from the audience, uh, questions, criticisms and such. We want these to actually be lively discussions of uh, management and uh, hopefully we have prepared some uh, tasty cases for you guys that you'll enjoy. Alrighty, so we put together a nice presentation of uh, several different types of cases and we hope that it will really stimulate some discussion. I see that Dr. Maiman has left the room. Well, I was going to tell him that we, uh, we tried to make the colors UCLA Bruin. So, you know, he, he has the football game that he's looking forward to tomorrow. So I tried to wear a little bit of a Bruin shirt for him. You know, nothing with the Oregon style. Well, you can tell him all about it. <laughs> All right, so our first case, um, we are affectionately calling Lost to Follow-Up, is a uh, wonderful 24-year-old uh, female with tricuspid atresia. She had a classic right atrial to uh, pulmonary artery fontan at the age of two years. She was followed regularly by her pediatric cardiologist at an outside institution, and she developed intra-atrial reentrant tachycardia around age 17. She subsequently underwent a electrophysiologic study and had an ablation. Her last visit with her pediatric cardiologist was at the time of her EP study and ablation at the age of 17. The patient then went off to college. She now works for a major international airline. For three weeks prior to uh, coming to UCLA, she was feeling more tired than usual. She felt just sort of out of sorts, but she continued to work. And then finally, she went to a local hospital and uh, was transferred up here. So, she subsequently had an echo, uh, EKG, which uh, demonstrated that she was in uh, atrial flutter with a uh, variable block. It was usually three to one block, and occasionally she would go into two to one block. Uh, the patient was hemodynamically stable. She was talking. She had good perfusion. Her heart rates were in the 130s to 140s. Her blood pressure was 120 over 84 millimeters of mercury. Her saturation was 88%. And she was on four liters of oxygen at that time uh, by nasal cannula. We did some labs and her BNP was 397 picograms per ml and her creatinine was normal around one. Just wanted to invite any thoughts or, or comments at this point. <laughs> oh, you're back. Excellent. <laughs> I mean, they were ready for it. <laughs> Clearly, we have a problem. Uh, what, because of the teeth? Because of the teeth. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we're talking about a, an atrial arrhythmia that is poorly rate controlled in a Fontan patient who's not feeling well, who's desaturated who has a high BNP, who has physical examination evidence of, I think you said there was some volume overload or no? Yes. Volume yes. overload, the patient's desaturated. We've got a major problem. This is uh, an absolute emergency for a Fontan patient. This should not be allowed to go, what was it now, three weeks that she'd been feeling poorly? She had been feeling poorly for three weeks. She was just tired. She thought she had caught a cold or flu type symptoms and, um, and it took her a while to get into for care at an outside hospital. And was she on any anticoagulation? She was not. So that's an additional problem. Was she on birth control pills? She was not. Oh, okay, good. She is engaged to be married though. So I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about, we're talking about a, a, a number of, of factors here that make this a, a really high risk situation for someone with an RAPA Fontaine. And I think the message here would be that this is the kind of patient that you want to come in the day that they have the arrhythmia or the day they start to feel poor. You're going to show us more, I presume? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you know, obviously what Jamil's alluding to is we see their ventricular function, which whatever ventricle they have left. Um, 
And you said this is classic trichosmic atresia, right? So the left end. From the records that we had at yeah. this point, we have. classic we've, trichosmic atresia, fortunately the LV lasts a little longer than the RV, but you can find their EFs or whatever you want to measure in systolic function can drop by over half within a very short period of time. So they go into ventricular failure. That can augment atrial ventricular valve regurgitation, which can raise their venous, pulmonary venous pressures, which can impede the Fontan circulation. And, and if they have a capacious right atrium, there's a good chance she's going to, like Daniel says, she's going to develop a clot in it, and therefore she risks death or major pulmonary embolism. Other than that, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to some imaging here. All right, so here we see the uh, typical uh, findings in a patient who has uh, tricuspid atresia, um, a single ventricle here, um, and you can see that the ventricular function is pretty um, markedly uh, depressed, and then in the lower uh, images here, we, we, we can see that there's uh, AV valvular regurgitation. You know, I, I will say one thing about this. If you look at the left upper panel, the parasternal long axis, ventricular function looks terrible. Uh, ER is 20%. But if you look at the apical four chamber view, it looks a lot better. It's and the thing short. about that it's is it's foreshortened A, but B, we're dealing with somebody who has an atrial arrhythmia, a rhythm that is changing the beat to beat variation, in my opinion, in the, during an atrial arrhythmia, is such that it's really tough to tell with absolute certainty what the EF is. Mm -hmm. But from the three uh, images that we're given here, if I took two of them, I'd say the EF is terrible, and one of them would look like the EF is okay. So the EF is, in my opinion, not very good. Plus, you've got, well, and actually, you know, I, I will say Dr. Perloff whispered in my ear a second ago, before you showed this, he said, does she have mitral regurgitation? Add, add to that, the other thing is, although regional wall motion and systolic function assessment in these single ventricle type situations is not as easy or, or as absolute. What you'll notice if you look at the parasternal view, the septum, although remember this is not the usual type of septum because the situation is barely contracting and, and that's held up at the base to mid uh, apical view. And then the other thing is even though it looks like there's decent lateral wall motion on the four chamber view, by and large, the few times we've been able to look at things like stress and strain analysis, the longitudinal um, contraction is actually impaired. So that, that's the problem with EF. And the, other, the other part about this echocardiogram is, you know, um, <clears throat> typically with tricuspid atresia and RAPA fontan, you'd expect a gigantic right atrium. You wouldn't really expect a gigantic left atrium. That is a very, very large left atrium, mm -hmm. which tells me that you can even see the left atrial appendage beautifully there in that uh, right upper panel. Um, and so, which tells me that that left atrium has been exposed to elevated pressures and elevated filling pressures mm -hmm. for some time. And I doubt that this is all just three weeks old, given the size of that left atrium. Um, and then not to mention the, what appears to be severe mitral regurgitation yeah. here. All right, so we'll continue to move on. So she came in in the evening. She was seen by our EP colleagues at the same time. We uh, decided that the patient would uh, then be taken for a um, EP study, uh, TEE, and plan for a cardio version of the next morning. Um, at the time of uh, induction of anesthesia, the, and the TEE probe was uh, inserted shortly after that time, and the patient became uh, bradycardic and developed PEA arrest. She was given uh, CPR and epinephrine uh, with a recovery of her uh, uh, pulse within less than one minute. However, she remained a little bit hypotensive with heart rates in the 140, and she was placed on uh, a little bit of dopamine and epinephrine. So at that point, we then put in the TE probe again. Well, I, think, I think one thing I'd like to just say about that is, um, you know, anesthesia and induction of anesthesia in any patient with depressed ventricular function, right or left ventricular function, is, and especially in Fontan patients and failing Fontan patients, is, is uh, uh, something to be taken with extreme seriousness. I mean, I, I, I've had some tragic stories when people go under anesthesia, especially with depressed ventricular function. Um, propofol is, is well known uh, to cause uh, myocardial depression, and you can get 
a significant drop in ejection fraction just with induction of anesthesia. Uh, plus, you have the drop in SVR. Um, so, uh, a difficult situation. And then you add on top of that the uh, vagal stimulation of the TE probe being inserted that, that may have also precipitated this event as well. Yeah, but she may have just thrown a pulmonary embolus. Absolutely. I mean, it may be the other hemodynamic things, but there's a good chance that she has a ready for plot for a pulmonary embolus. Absolutely. Dr. Perler, Perlock, were you about to? Uh, yeah, I was about to say this is a stereotype. The uh, patient with tricuspid atresia that we used to see, uh, the main issue uh, was the degree of mitral regurgitation. They virtually all had mitral regurgitation. The circulation depends on the left ventricle. Uh, the uh, uh, risk in tricuspid atresia within this setting as uh, Jamil said, it's a disturbance in rhythm. Whatever the disturbance in rhythm is, it has to be addressed at that time uh, without, uh, without any delay. Uh, in addition, anything that depresses contractility of the left ventricle is going to augment the mitral regurgitation and very suddenly, within minutes, uh, make things worse. All right, so the TE probe was inserted. You can see here that her ventricular function is even worse than uh, when she came in. Um, in the upper left-hand panel, you can see the uh, uh, spontaneous echo smoke that we can see in the uh, Fontan, uh, demonstrating that there's very poor flow there. Uh, in the upper right-hand panel, you can see that we discovered a uh, thrombus in the uh, Fontan in the lower portion of the, of the atrium. Um, we also subsequently found in the right lower-hand corner um, a fenestration in the Fontan uh, with uh, some bidirectional flow, but primarily right to left. When you have such a dilated tricuspid annulus there that you don't even have coaptation really of the anterior and posterior uh, uh, leaflets there. And, um, so not unexpected. And the decrease in saturations can also be explained by that uh, residual fenestration there. Uh, probably acting as a bit of a, of a pop-off, but it's popping off both ways. You can see left to right flow and right to left flow. Um, Absolutely, anything else? Okay. As we mentioned, uh, in this atrial arrhythmia, the patient continued to have very poor ventricular function. We measured her CVP um, uh, shortly after the uh, CPR and after the TE was being performed, and uh, it was uh, 33 millimeters of mercury. Um, we were obviously very concerned about putting further catheters up into the Fontan, given the discovery of the, of the thrombus. Um, and the questions that we were asking at this time in the cath lab was, uh, would her cardiac function continue to tolerate this abnormal rhythm? And now we're in a very tough spot of do we cardiovert in the presence of a thrombus and a uh, uh, fenestration in the Fontan with bidirectional shunting. So it was a rock and a hard place if you'd like to, to expound. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember this case well. I was actually <laughs> doing a cohort case in a different lab, and, and then the code got called, so ran in and, and uh, joined these folks for this. And, and uh, Dr. Moore from EP was there as well. And, and, you know, in the end, frankly, I think that if somebody's hemodynamically unstable, um, because of an unstable rhythm that they're not tolerating that, uh, you know, we have to take care of the rhythm and, you know, if an embolism occurs, it occurs. Um, uh, so um, my thought was to uh, go ahead and try to get her out of this rhythm um, and understand that uh, because she, she just was, you know, hemodynamically very, very unstable. At this what was time. her level of consciousness at this time? She was under general anesthesia still. Oh, so she's already under anesthesia. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you don't have time to anticoagulate her, so you're just gonna have, you, if you're going to save her, you got to get her out of that rhythm. Period. Absolutely. So we actually, um, the team continued to work on the patient, um, and then uh, we actually had a discussion with the family to keep them abreast of what had happened. Um, we also informed them of the discovery of the thrombus in the Fontan. Um, we certainly uh, did not have a sense of when the thrombus had formed, whether it had been uh, in the preceding years or just in the three weeks prior to uh, her presentation. Um, 
We then proceeded with uh, cardioversion and the patient's sinus rhythm was restored, although she was bradycardic in the uh, 50s, even on a little bit of uh, uh, inotropic support. Um, and then uh, uh, TEE demonstrated that the thrombus had not embolized uh, to, to the best of our knowledge, and it had not changed in size uh, from the uh, previous images. Uh, her CVP remained about 33. We got a head CT to uh, make sure that there wasn't any other embolic phenomenon that we weren't catching, which was normal. She was subsequently diuresed uh, significantly with IV Lasix and uh, ultimately was uh, discharged home. Uh, we actually have seen her in clinic uh, very recently. She continues on afterload therapy, heart failure therapy, and amiodarone for the control of her arrhythmias. When you said you did a heart CT, did you look for pulmonary embolism when you did that? No, this was a head CT. Head CT. I, no, no, I thought from here I couldn't see it. I said heart CT. Oh, my. Oh, head. Okay. Yeah. And, and if, so if you I, didn't look for pulmonary embolism. Just, just said we're going to anticoagulate her anyway, so it doesn't matter. You know. Right. It wouldn't have changed our yeah, management profoundly, so we did not. I agree. If I recall correctly, then you could correct me if I'm wrong, but, but with rhythm control and rate control and on, on good medications, uh, her EF did improve, the degree of mitral regurgitation decreased significantly, the CVP came down nicely. So a lot of this improved, but I think we continue to be hesitant about sending her for a Fontan conversion, given the fact that she still has depressed ventricular function. And this is a kind of person, frankly, that is heading ultimately, in my opinion, towards um, heart transplant Dr. evaluation. Um, and biopsying her liver, I think, is gonna be a key component uh, of the decision making here as far as just a heart versus a heart liver. Dr. Dang can maybe talk about that a bit. Yeah, this is uh, actually exactly what I was uh, like, uh, what I was thinking about, like to contribute from the ignorance of an adult heart failure cardiologist. This presentation um, feels at least as high risk as uh, the very advanced stage of heart failure, and obviously in a 24 year old. Uh, options beyond the current heart reparative uh, uh, tools should be um, then considered. The problem from an adult con uh, cardiologist's perspective is really the ignorance. I need to openly state this um, in comparison to the uh, uh, adult onset uh, situation. This um, is probably a very, very advanced uh, stage where the arrhythmia is already um, basically um, reflecting the progression of hemodynamic changes. And I would like, for example, to raise one question that um, relates to loss of follow-up. How do we organize care between age 17 and 24? There must have been a time interval where things have been progressing. And number two, um, in the uh, intensive care setting, and I want to add uh, actually our first uh, pilot on September 28 uh, of the uh, congenital heart failure clinic um, next Friday, which we uh, want to um, uh, exactly for this purpose uh, implement to have a more longitudinal view of these complex patients. And the question that um, I would like to discuss, um, what if she weren't converting into sinus of 50, but what if she'd continue to uh, come back with a 180 weight? What if she weren't stabilizing? What options would we have? And what is the view on uh, short-term mechanical support in this kind of situation? Uh, the answer is, I don't know. Because when, for example, at the International Society for Lung Transplantation in Prague this April, this discussion went on, uh, there was a variety of opinions from yes is already established, a ventricular assist concept, to nothing is established. So you brought up an awful lot of uh, big points, but I'll talk to briefly the transitional care issues that I think that we're trying to uh, bridge. I think in um, a uh, medical system here in the United States where we have a lot of fractionation of medical care, um, we have to develop transitional care where we have an appropriate handoff to um, adult uh, congenital providers from the pediatric population. We also see in our patients that this is a high risk time when they're going from the age of 15 to 25. Patients often feel that they're invincible. They don't um, want to acknowledge some of their medical issues. And a lot of times their medical issues have been managed solely by their parents and they haven't been given the independence tools over their medical care to be able to bridge that gap for themselves. So I think that in the pediatric world, we're doing a lot to try and support parents and patients to help them develop 
the uh, skills necessary to um, transition into the adult population. Uh, we specifically at UCLA have a program that we're, we're developing right now. It's in the sort of beginnings of it, and I work with uh, Mary Canobio there. And uh, we hope to um, initiate these types of discussions around the age of 12. By the age of 15, we're hoping that patients are starting to make their own appointments. Obviously, if this is developmentally appropriate, we try and focus on children understanding what medications they're on, that their congenital heart disease is not cured by the surgeries that they have. I think there's often a misconception about um, the understanding of uh, what heart surgery does for patients. Um, and we hope that we also bring into um, the discussion the importance of insurability, the importance of reproductive counseling. Um, and in this patient, obviously, reproductive counseling is a big issue. She's currently engaged. Um, I don't think that had she not had this incident, she probably would have moved on and gotten pregnant even be before seeing a, uh, a cardiologist, before getting exercise testing, as Dr. Lynn talked about. Um, and also, I think one of the things that we often talk about in our Fontan patients is should they be anticoagulated from the beginning? And I think that's uh, a moving target, but maybe something the panel can address as well. Uh, you know, I, I, my, my view on anticoagulation in Fontaine's is somewhat swayed by the occasional really terrible event where somebody has some major thromboembolic complication. And it's, it's, it's a changing view. I, I, I would say an RA to PA Fontaine in the presence of any arrhythmia is an indication in my mind to be on full anticoagulation. Uh, that, that, I think, is, is you know, uh, a very defensible position. But anticoagulating the extracardiac Fontan patient who does not have any arrhythmia, who's, you know, what is the benefit of that? Um, well, maybe over decades, the reduced risk of thromboembolic complications, which is anywhere from about 7% to 33%, depending on uh, the studies that, uh, that you look at, um, you know, over the course of, of uh, a few decades. Um, so my practice has been to anticoagulate those high-risk fontans or those with proven thrombi, um, but uh, at least give um, antiplatelet therapy to those with the newer forms of fontan uh, of physiology who don't have uh, atrial arrhythmias. Um, you know, I'm not sure how much good that's really doing, frankly. We don't have a lot of evidence. Um, but um, what would you folks do? I would, uh, I agree. I think anticoagulation is uh, an issue uh, that is, is still debated. It's, it's still the disturbance of rhythm is the criteria. Well, the good news is the RAPA Fontana, which is the thing that we're most commonly having this issue with, we don't do anymore. So we kind of we're, so we're left with all those who are 20, 30 years old who had these. And I think it ought to be governed by, as you said, I think an isolated incident incidence of atrial arrhythmia probably is a good reason to switch from antiplatelets, which I do in all of them, to uh, warfarin therapy. The flip side, though, is. In our, in my limited experience of, of seeing these people over years, unless they've gone into an atrial arrhythmia to actually have an embolic event is very, very uncommon, unless they're, they had an arrhythmia. So I must admit, even if somebody says, well, our series shows there's a 7% incidence over 30 years, the, the incident per year, you have to balance that against what's the incidence of the side effect from full anticoagulation, which is, you know, half a percent to a percent per year of something serious happening. You know, so it's a balance of risk. So, so I, I think the, 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 the conduits, if you wish, all deserve antiplatelet therapy. And the, the key issue is should they be orphan for the first six months and then the inkling of any arrhythmia go back on it? I'm just not sure. Uh, well, one other thing I'm gonna bring up also oh, is- Oh, let me just throw, the flip side is if you get into people who have depressed ventricular function, they have left atrial enlargement, et cetera, you're, you're almost now back to dealing with them like adults who have adult non-congenital heart disease. You, you, there are other criteria that you might apply to an adult who didn't have their underlying disease, you know. We'll uh, start to move on to the next case, okay? Thank you. <laughs>
All right. So, well, one other thing I, I just wanted to say about that is that note that on the transthoracic echo, we didn't see the thrombus. Um, this week, I was catheterizing a young woman just yesterday or the day before uh, for um, consideration of Fontan conversion from an old RAPA to an extra cardiac Fontan or lateral tunnel Fontan. And no um, uh, arrhythmias currently. She had had arrhythmias previously and had had them ablated. Um, but was just on aspirin, and uh, Dr. Lin was doing the transesophageal echo, and lo and behold, there was a nice little thrombus there. So I think that one of the things that, that um, uh, I have now started to do routinely for all Fontan cats is number one, do them under anesthesia, number two, transesophageal echo, uh, looking for these things, and number three, if you have them under anesthesia and you can get to their liver uh, via the IJ, then uh, do a liver biopsy while you're in there and see if they have cirrhosis because of the risk of advanced liver damage. Discuss the differential diagnosis of the desaturation in the Fontan population. Uh, I know you mentioned about the bidirectional shunt, but the other causes as well, if you can expand on that. Thank you. Yeah, so um, there are, you know, numerous reasons why a Fontan patient is going to be desaturated from issues of intrapulmonary shunting, micro AVMs large AVMs or fistulae, micro-AVMs in the presence of, of liver disease or in those with one of the cross your heart fontans where all they have is SVC flow uh, without uh, hepatic effluent in it. So we know that those patients have a higher risk of developing uh, 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 intrapulmonary shunts. So that's one area. Then going back, venovenous collaterals, fenestrations um, of this type. If the coronary sinus drains into the pulmonary venous atrium, that will also cause them to desaturate. Um, so uh, I think uh, at the time of catheterization, uh, and really this is again why TE is so useful, or even intracardiac echo in these cases could be quite useful for this sort of thing, is, is to look for all of these things, to look for fenestrations, to look for micro AVMs, and the way you're gonna be able to tell that is by injecting agitated saline into the branch pulmonary arteries and seeing it return to the heart via uh, the ipsilateral pulmonary veins. Um, and then, you know, are they not oxygenating appro appropriately because they have a thrombus in their left pulmonary artery and do they have a pulmonary embolism? So uh, those would be the things on my differential as far as desaturation in the Fontan patient. So the next case is another patient with a Fontan and we tried to choose a couple of failing Fontan patients in order to highlight different issues. This was a 44-year-old man with tricuspid atresia, pulmonary stenosis, and DMAL post grade arteries. He had a classic, which is right atrium to pulmonary artery fontan at the age of 22, and he had depressed single ventricle function evident immediately. Progressively over the years, he worsened, and his LV is now markedly dilated with an ejection fraction of 15%, and he's had a history of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. He's now maintained on chronic amiodarone and carvedilol. We discussed transplantation in 2005 with him, but he preferred to defer. We started Rivadio in 2010, and now he's presenting with worsening palpitation and volume overload, so we've decided to take him to the cardiac catheterization lab to look at his hemodynamics. So I'd like to ask the panel, at this point, what kinds of conversations should we be having with a patient like this and with regards to his potential need for future transplantation and what kinds of therapies he might expect would be recommended? In the meantime, yeah, it's great that um, in 2005 the question of heart transplantation has been discussed with the gentleman. Uh, obviously, from an insight that the current uh, medical therapy would probably or potentially not be as good as adding heart transplant eval and listing and transplantation. So, what um, first of all I find important is um, that the patient, obviously, who is the boss over his destiny and makes the ultimate decision at that time, must have felt some reason to defer. And um, I'm curious in understanding um, a patient reasoning um, uh, of um, uh, the trajectory, um, assuming that he'd be willing to go for life prolonging and quality of life enhancing therapies if necessary, he must have felt stability. And um, obviously, then seven years later, things uh, probably have changed, but um, would be very interested in that aspect because I think the ongoing um, evolving encounter between team and patient and family. 
to outline the different options in a longitudinal pattern. That's also what I wanted to emphasize in the previous case, where I feel there was a missed uh, uh, window of opportunity of a longitudinal counseling. This is, I think, where we really have to take responsibility and proactively outline the different options much earlier, uh, just as theoretical options, but present them alongside. So patients can make up their minds and see in a changing trajectory also a potentially uh, time point where now to say yes to an evaluation. I, I mean, I, I agree. I think, I think the, the problem with transplant timing and timing of listing a Fontan patient is that Fontan patients do not fit into a UNOS box. They are, are exceptions. They're exceptions to the rules. They do not present in the same way. It's not typically systemic ventricular failure causing pulmonary edema. Um, you know, it's, it's insidious damage over many, many years. I mean, this is an example of somebody with a dilated ventricle, but, but there are those who have, uh, you know, systemic ventricles that work quite well, but still have very high Fontan pressures and failing Fontans. So, it's, it's a little bit difficult and, and the data out there doesn't really guide us very much because we know transplant outcomes in Fontan patients are not good. But are they not good because of the intrinsic nature of the Fontan? Or are they not good because we're waiting way too long until people's livers have failed and their kidneys are uh, 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 not doing well and they're on the precipice of multi-organ failure because of a chronic low output state? So. Uh, the timing is, uh, I think, uh, uh, something very, very difficult for us to, to figure out, and we're really not guided by much data, uh, and that's, that's the unfortunate part of it. Let me ask Dr. Ding, back in 2005, what was the uh, seven-year survival rate for standard cardiac transplantation? Forget congenital heart disease, which is worse. So we had um, in the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation and median survival that um, across the, like at that time, 80,000 heart transplants in the world of um, uh, 10 years. It's right now in the 11 year range and um, in individual centers such as ours, it's in the 13 year range. But um, that, that's uh, roughly where one would look at. And now I may add, even at that time, and I'll allude in my talk to this uh, tomorrow as well, except for the first uh, year, in specific, the first three months period post transplant in Fontan patients, their long term, five year and 10 year survival is not in any way different. In other words, the risk early on uh, reverses because since these patients are usually young, they have less of a long-term risk. In other words, at 10-year post-transplantation, all the statistics of the International Society, um, a complex congenital is not a risk factor. But I guess what I'm, if you don't have congenital heart disease, in 2005, what we knew of the five-year or 10-year survival in general, not congenital heart disease, what was the percent of survival for five years, let's say? In five years, uh, 65 to 70 percent, okay. and 10 years in the range of uh, 55. So, so if we split the difference for seven years, he had a, he had a 35 plus percent chance of not being alive now. So he's defied those statistics. And as Jamil says, we don't have enough of these who look like this who we know what to take, because I've seen some exceptional longevities in people who have Fontans of this type, with or without ventricular dysfunction, including one guy who first had his Fontan when he was in his 40s, and he died of non-cardiac reasons 10, late, 10 years later. Um, and I don't know which guy you're, which you're presenting here, but I know we have isolated instances of people who are medically savvy who say they can walk and do what they want to do, et cetera, despite a, an LV that measures seven or eight centimeters in diastole, and you have to look carefully to see what, when it's contracting. You know, those EF looks like it's 15% if, if you're being generous, and yet they seem to be fine. And so the real problem that Jamil raises is we've had a few instances where as things begin to change, we've transplanted them, and some of them have died during the transplant period, and, and, and that's why Jamil shifted over to more refined analysis of the liver and so on. Anyway, I'm, I'm just not certain that we have data for this guy. Um, but as you saw way back then, 
the center was discussing this with him. And, and I can think of one specific individual who was very medically savvy, and, and we discussed all the options. I don't know if it's him. And he medically made a conscious decision that, that he was not going to have a transplant based on what he knew about transplant. You know, it wasn't that nobody guided him. He decided. Yes, I, th I think that's an important point. This was someone who was medically savvy, who felt really well, was able to work at his job, was very functional. So that's part of what guided his decision. But he, we did inform him of all the sort of risks and benefits. This is his echocardiogram, and you can see that he has a massively dilated left ventricle with reduced uh, systolic function. And the short axis view shows it really nicely. You can see that there are portions that are nearly akinetic. And here's a nice picture, I think, of tricuspid atresia. You can see the plate-like uh, tricuspid valve without an orifice. And so we took him to the cardiac catheterization lab, and you can see here that he has uh, a classic, uh, which is an RA to PA Fontan. His Fontan pressure is 17, which is elevated. It's not the worst we've seen. But when we see this in someone with a failing Fontan, as we've kind of alluded to, it's important to look at the liver. Uh, which we did. His liver biopsy showed no cirrhosis, so that was a reassuring finding. You can also see um, that his uh, single ventricle end diastolic pressure is mildly elevated to 15. He had a wedge of 13, which is not bad. Um, but one thing uh, that we noticed was his systemic saturation was 81%, and we touched upon this why would someone with a Fontan have a systemic uh, saturation so low? And in his case, he had a prominent venous collateral, which I'll show a picture of in a moment, which was contributing to his cyanosis. And so uh, we included that, and you can see that his saturation rose from 81 to 86 percent. But, but you know, I, I actually i am the one to blame for including this, but um, you know, note that the mean Fontan pressure goes from 14 to 17. So what we gain in saturation, we lose in, um, in liver, potentially. Um, you know, be that as it may, uh, he actually felt a lot better with a higher saturation. And uh, uh, we were able to diurese him, and really he didn't have much in the way of, of right heart failure. And I was reassured by the fact that his liver biopsy uh, did not show uh, cirrhosis. So. Because I'm not sure what right heart failure is going to say. <laughs> you can. Uh, this is just a picture. You can see here that he has. Uh, if you were going up um, into the innominate vein, and he has a large collateral returning to the heart, which is con causing his, uh, contributing to his cyanosis. And the reason for that is it's basically a pop off, which is why when we occluded, his um, Fontan pressure went up. And uh, this is just a nice picture we've injected into the right atrium and Fontan. And you can see that the right atrium, um, the appendage here has been connected to the pulmonary artery. It's very dilated, and the pulmonary, you know, the Fontan connection here is dilated as well. And so we occluded that venous collateral, and he felt a lot better. He did well for many months. Um, this cath was last year, and then a few months ago, he presented back to clinic after doing well for one year, and he kind of had this syncopal episode that he noted. He had the sudden onset of dizziness, no palpitations, and just suddenly lost consciousness. We performed a 24-hour Holter, which showed frequent PVCs and two runs of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. So I'd like to actually just interject here. We're called a lot by patients with various complaints who have very complex anatomy and very complex disease. But there are some major red flags, and I think one of the red flags is syncope. Somebody has syncope. Uh, you know, I think that the place they belong is the emergency room until their rhythm issue is figured out and they have the appropriate protection. Um, and I think getting a Holter monitor, that's fine, but frankly, it's best that that be done in an inpatient setting. And I, um, you know, what we're talking about all of these, you know, gray zones and, you know, uh, uh, where Fontan patients lie and, and what you should do and when. And, and I think the, the, the end stage is if somebody is having syncopal episodes, you have to assume that it's an unstable rhythm just like that young woman had or like this man had and um, uh, uh, admit them into the hospital and the workup should take place in the hospital, in my but, opinion on that. Jamil, so you opened the door there. Um, here you're finding non-sustained VTAC. What is the appropriate protection? 
Good question. <laughs> Good question. A new heart. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, the, the problem here is a, is a, I mean, so you cannot put, uh, you can't put a transvenous ICD in this patient. So you would have to put in an epicardial system. Traditionally, the epicardial systems are going to require a thoracotomy or a sternotomy and, and pretty extensive surgery, which this man may not survive. You know, we put him under anesthesia and he may have exactly what that other young woman had, just crash, his ventricular function is terrible. So it's, it's a, plus then you're putting in a thoracotomy in somebody who's really heading, I think, towards transplant. So, um, but there are, you know, newer, less invasive options that don't require a thoracotomy that could potentially be considered in this setting. Um, but in all truth, I think this is a good example of somebody that is heading towards needing a new heart. And maybe the arrhythmia is the index event where you say, you know what, now it's time uh, to uh, move forward with a transplant evaluation. So I think we kind of touched upon this. Um, the other thing is, would we feel comfortable recommending just a, a heart transplant? and? in the face of the normal liver biopsy. So, but, but I think that's where doing the liver biopsy as a standard um, uh, procedure when Kathy Fontan patients is, is important. And again, this is just a personal opinion is that, you know, thank God we had established this already um, in this patient that he did not have cirrhosis because we would have then been trying to figure this out and delaying his listing and such until the time when we got the samples back and so uh, in a way it just it's it's I think only a heart is needed and you know the argument can also be made well how do we know that, that you know congestive hepatopathy responds very well to heart replacement right if it's our uh, uh, um, uh, heart transplant so you know to, to expose people to liver transplantation just because some of the tissue shows cirrhosis but you still have pretty good um, synthetic function of the liver is also, you know, I mean, we've, we've done that. We've done a heart liver transplant on somebody who had good synthetic function, but the liver biopsy showed, um, showed cirrhosis. Uh, I'm just not sure it's actually the right thing to do. Um, you know, but, but it makes sense and it makes everybody more comfortable and it makes the hepatologists more comfortable as well. Um, but could these people, even with cirrhosis, do just fine if you just do a heart transplant? Dr. Lax is not here today. I actually feel strongly that they would. Um, so, you know, but again, it's, it's a matter of opinion. We just don't have enough data, longitudinal data to tell us. I, I guess the other question that I had was, what about sort of screening for liver disease in these patients? And should we or should we be thinking about it? I mean, the last two patients have been cath because of symptoms, but when do we sort of go looking for liver disease? Um, so... This is, uh, as part of our standard practice in Fontan patients, both here as well as when we, when we come to Nevada to the, to the Children's Heart Center and, and has been to try to image the liver in some way. Uh, the problem with ultrasound imaging is that it's notoriously unreliable. We've had patients who have no evidence of cirrhosis by ultrasound, who have full-blown cirrhosis when you go ahead and do a liver biopsy, those. You know, so it's, it's just a CTA and MRA, MRV are better. Um, but again, we get a lot of readings on MRIs that say, you know, lobular liver with fibrosis and uh, likely cirrhosis. So uh, I think we need to get tissue. There is an assay out there. It's called the FibroSure um, uh, test, and it's basically a combination of various liver labs, GGT and albumin, and uh, uh, then it goes into some complex equation, and they give you a score that matches the amount of cirrhosis seen by... Um, uh, histology. Uh, it's a send out lab and frankly it's been a real pain to get insurances to pay for it, to send it out and bring it back so we haven't been using it routinely but some centers are using it routinely like at, uh, at Boston Children's, uh, uh, the adult congenital program there, they're using this fibro short test in Wisconsin they're using it. Uh, we're part of a multi-center uh, uh, study uh, where we're collecting the data on liver biopsies on all these patients and looking at how good the non-invasive imaging is. Um, but uh, I, I agree that we should do imaging, we should do uh, measures of liver synthetic function, and we should be biopsying the liver because in the end I think the Achilles heel of the Fontan is going to be the liver. And, uh, part, I mean, part of the problem is the following. Uh, if um, the adult congenital population, this um, 
um, more frequently is undergoing heart transplant population, then the uh, criteria by which um, a heart transplant indication and contraindication is established from the adult uh, primary scenario needs to be uh, potentially modified if the behavior in a fontan with liver dysfunction is different from adult. In the adult um, criteria set, there is clearly end-stage uh, organ dysfunction that is not deemed reversible, established consensus-wise as a contraindication to a heart only, and therefore it's dual organ transplantation and all the, um, <coughs> let's say, uh, CMS criteria for establishing uh, uh, outcome uh, uh, records and comparing outcomes is based on this and therefore there is a scrutiny on the transplant center's overall structure and performance which is closely monitored. So one would then, and that uh, links into a uh, kind of discussion on the UNOS level, uh, modify certain criteria. By the way, also with regard to urgency of listing, UNOS you know, status 1, A, 1, B criteria in the, uh, this population are not um, uh, adequately reflected in the adult world. So there's a lot of uh, implications, I think, that we're just beginning to understand that we need to work on politically. Looks like we have an audience question. Thank you very much, an excellent discussion. Uh, Dr. Dang raised this uh, particular issue of uh, how to, what are the different options of managing these uh, failing adult from tan patients. And so one topic that I wanted to ask the panel, particularly at this moment since we're discussing MELD score and how you list them, or whether you list them for, you know, dual organ transplantation, is the utility of uh, ventricular assist in the single, in the failing single ventricle, and uh, whether this is something that could potentially be used as a bridge, while maybe on the list to see if liver function would improve, uh, or potentially maybe even for the people that have demonstrated uh, fixed uh, cirrhosis, whether they might potentially be candidates for destination therapy. Well, that, that, that discussion is um, um, very appropriate, but also very, let's say, void of um, established criteria. The um, um, uh, question, uh, if there is a benefit, kind of an analogy to uh, the uh, adult onset heart failure situation from lifetime mechanical support, is being addressed in a study that's run out of uh, Tim Eisenobel's um, uh, East Coast um, uh, Center in a, a randomized comparison, but no data are in. And as I said, the discussion is completely open in the sense of um, uh, not knowing if left ventricular assistance is a similar benefit. The question coming up in that moment is then, um, after the, you know, while the about 20,000 uh, left ventricular assist devices have been done um, for long-term support and now a, a series of more than 1,000 total artificial heart being done on the Freedom Driver, more than uh, 60 patients discharged home with this 11-pound uh, device um, uh, equipment. Um, and um, amongst the first recipients were uh, those in a congenital condition. So that question is coming up, but um, uh, although in Southern California we have four centers, UCSD, CEDAS, USC, and um, our center with total artificial hearts, we don't have any um, kind of long-term experience yet. Well, but I mean, this is, I think, why we want to have uh, an adult congenital heart failure uh, clinic is for us, the adult congenital specialists, to be in the same room, in the same setting, with the transplant and ventricular assist doctors, with the surgeons, and sit there and all of us uh, discuss these, very, and you know, the, the, these, are, these are, it's for cases exactly like this, the ones that are teetering and which way do you go, and I, I just don't think we have a lot of evidence to guide us as to when to act. But, it seems to me that the role of ventricular assist device is not just for the failing ventricle, but also for the failing fontan in the presence of good ventricular function um, is uh, 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 going to be, you know, the next horizon, the next big leap in the care of these patients is going to be uh, the assist to the failing fontan. Eric Tarno from Oslo. Thank you for a good discussion. We, we have this topic in uh, in the European Society meeting in Munich a couple of weeks ago. And um, to the surprise, there were reports that patients that had these devices operated in and uh, waiting for transplant 
They felt so well that they refused to be transplanted. They went on with these mechanical devices with a much improved quality of life and physical performance. And we had a long discussion if that's going to be the future, that we have to be prepared that these devices are not a bridge to transplant that in way of treating also single ventricles. Of course, complications with thrombus, anticoagulation, infections and all that stuff. But it's surprising to think that in the future, mechanical devices may be something which is an option by itself, not necessarily the bridge to transplant. Do you have any comments on that from here? I couldn't agree more. I mean, if we, if we consider um, taking Professor Perloff's latest edition of the textbook of 1.5 million adults, complex congenital conditions, 1% uh, of the population, uh, you know, 1.3% of the population, and we uh, just um, will have a uh, very, very, very small and limited number of organ transplantations, which is really uh, in the range of uh, two and a half thousand in the country, and um, in internationally less than 5,000 per year. So the uh, factor 10 times 20 um, uh, to transplant of long-term ventricular assistance in general applies here as well. And um, the important thing is that in um, the um, experience um, accrues, we do have the Intermax mandatory reporting mechanism in the US with the 160 destination mechanical support centers mandatorily reporting and more than 5,000 um, uh, devices registered, so we will be in a position to analyze um, those indications separately. And I think that's the basis uh, on which one would proceed. And then, um, coming to your comment, um, the importance in communicating to the patient is not the either or question at the time of evaluation. Uh, are you a transplant candidate and therefore this is a bridge to transplantation? or are you not a candidate and therefore this is destination support. The um, failing hemodynamic situation before multi-organ dysfunction sets in, the failing fontan, for example, would be a long-term uh, support at that time. And later on, the question of whether this is a bridge or uh, a, a lifetime indication can be uh, evaluated. This is, um, uh, I think, the emerging uh, discussion uh, in the field in general. I think we'll move on then. Um, so we offered him an ICD and he declined. He still was feeling well. Um, I'm sorry, we offered him an ICD. We talked about transplant again. He declined. And um, we scheduled it. And the following day, he collapsed suddenly at home. The paramedics were called and he was in a VT, VF arrest. He was successfully defibrillated, resuscitated, and transferred to us and thankfully made a complete neurological recovery and he's currently listed for transplantation. So, you know, uh, this man is, is in the hospital now and has been in the CCU at UCLA since the beginning of July. Um, I think we're talking about a life vest there. Um, but the, the decision when he was brought over from the outside hospital where he'd been taken uh, by ambulance was whether he needed some sort of um, protection right there and then because of uh, future uh, events and he just collapsed, he had VT and VF, but we made the decision to, at that point, list him for transplant, not open up his chest, not put in a uh, defibrillator, um, but just watch him in the CCU and he has essentially been one AE status and uh, hopefully we'll be getting a heart uh, one of these days and, and we'll have a good outcome but um, um, you know it's it's in this particular case you know the question is whether we waited too long and whether we were swayed by the man's medical know-how and his sense of well-being when um, you know when he really had life-threatening complications here um, you know would yearly holters, holters every six months, regular stress testing to pick up arrhythmias, those sorts of things, would, would those be useful for us to sort of unveil uh, uh, some, of these, uh, some of these problems before they present like this with, with sudden death? Um, I think so. I, I think the functional testing and the uh, you know, rhythm testing. I know at the, at the Children's Heart Center in Nevada, you know, a lot of patients are getting 
Holters on a regular basis every year. Uh, you know, we don't do that as a as a standard thing, but I, but I think in, in these subsets of patients that that makes a lot of sense um, uh, that we would look for these problems. And I think it makes a lot of sense for us to be a little more aggressive sometimes with patients, saying, you know what, you are about to fall off a precipice here. You may not feel that way, but you know, and it's. Um, People who have, who have lived in comfort for many, many years are very hesitant. Some of them just don't want to hear it. I mean, I have patients who don't even want to come see me because of it, because uh, they're afraid I'm going to bring it up to them. But, but it's, it's, you know, um, and I'm, I'm not the, you know, the warmest, most cuddly type here. But, but you know, it's, it's a, but, but, the, but, the, but, the real, but the reality here is that we've got a major problem and, you know, we, we should have detected this earlier. And I think I was fooled by the catheterization numbers and how well he was feeling. You know, uh, this should have been a discussion after the catheterization, um, in my mind. I think we'll move on to the next case. All right, so a lot of the issues we've uh, already discussed here, um, so I'll kind of go through this one a little bit um, uh, faster so that we can address um, some of the interesting issues that come up so that we're just not so focused on the Fontan. But this is a 30-year-old uh, female, again, with sort of a complicated single ventricle physiology with double outlet, right ventricle, pulmonary stenosis, and a large versus multiple uh, VSDs. She had a classic BT shunt at 18 months of age and had a Fontan at three years of age. She was first uh, diagnosed with atrial flutter um, approximately 14 uh, years ago, and she's been on chronic amiodarone. She's had multiple EP, EP studies, and she was found to have a thrombus in her uh, Fontan approximately eight years ago, so she's been on chronic anticoagulation for that. She uh, subsequently had an epicardial pacemaker, which I think is a point that we just made with the last case, is that these patients can't get uh, traditional uh, transvenous uh, pacemakers, and um, had multiple uh, hospitalizations for volume overload. Here's a quick peek at her echo, um, showing that the VSD is in just this very poor function in this highly trabeculated ventricle. In contrast to the last patient, her uh, Fontan pressure was in the uh, 25 range, and she actually had a stenosis at the level of the connection of the Fontan to the PAs, and that was uh, uh, stented during this procedure, which helped bring some of those pressures down. Um, but you know, the, the last patient had a Fontan pressure of 14 before the vascular plug went up to 17 after the, uh, after the vascular plug, and this patient at baseline has a, um, a pressure of 25 in that Fontan. So obviously we, we want to discuss whether or not we would consider a Fontan revision in this patient, um, transplantation. Uh, given that we've already discussed a lot of these issues, I'll continue uh, kind of going along. Um, she also had a workup for liver disease. And, um, you know, we had discussions about uh, transplant. Uh, she was felt not to be a Fontan revision candidate given her poor ventricular function and her high uh, pressure in the Fontan. Um, and the liver biopsy, unfortunately, noted cirrhosis. On the uh, CT scan, her liver was profoundly enlarged and had a <coughs> nodularity uh, pattern that's uh, consistent with a lot of um, hepatic congestion from uh, cardiac uh, reasons. Um, and the patient uh, subsequently underwent a uh, heart and liver transplant. Um, she had a very difficult post-operative course, uh, but was ultimately uh, discharged home and continues to recover. Um, so I just wanted to, to bring up this case uh, since we've learned a lot from uh, this as the first uh, cardiac and liver transplant at the same time that we've already sort of discussed as well and just wanted to, to kind of like put that out there and then we'll move on to the, the cases that are not Fontans. Well, I think one thing about this, uh, this case and one thing we should cover is, is who's a candidate and who's not a candidate for Fontan conversion surgery from an old RAPA Fontan to now typically an extra cardiac Fontan with arrhythmia surgery. This woman would have actually, if, if you look at her systolic function, I followed her for years, her systolic function is actually not that bad. Her major problem was diastolic dysfunction with a stiff ventricle and high filling pressures in that ventricle. Despite the stent, and I, I, think, I think I put the stent in a couple of years ago, right? With me. Yeah, Lee, Lee was scrubbed <laughs> in, that's right. We, we, uh, and um, you know, even after that, we recapped her and we put her on more diuretics and her Fontan pressures remained high, 18, 19, 20, plus the cirrhosis. In our series of 28 patients um, that we published a couple of years ago on Fontan conversions, but the two people that died, there was a 7% mortality or, or right around there, were both patients with cirrhosis. So in my mind, a contraindication of Fontan conversion is the presence of cirrhosis. Um, there are accepted criteria 
high filling pressures, a CVP greater than 16, an LVDP greater than 12, an LVEF that is lower, lower than 45%, an RVEF lower than 40%, moderate to severe AV valve regurgitation that can't be repaired at the time of Fontan conversion. So she sort of meets a couple of different criteria for not converting her, including the cirrhosis, the high CVP, and the elevated EDP. So I think the right decision was to actually transplant. So the question is, did we really need to do the liver transplant as well as the heart transplant? Um, and the answer is, well, we're not sure, but she's out of the hospital and, you know, uh, or left the hospital and was actually feeling pretty good eventually but she went through a good six to eight months of hell uh, to get there. Just in addition to that, this um, uh, uh, patient also demonstrated how important it is to take into consideration in the evaluation and decision-making process a uh, um, patient's um, perspective who has from uh, birth on a um, medical history who is very closely linked to mom and dad and uh, rightfully wants to be involved in all the decision making while mom and dad also rightfully watch like tigeresses over the medical team usually knowing much more about the detailed history than any white coat and uh, to appropriately budget time in the daily rounding structure to take this into consideration as opposed to taking this more reductionist approach that white coat knows best because it's evidence-based for getting the relational and translational aspect of the encounter. So this um, has led and um, maybe the CCU team members uh, or CTSE team members can comment on this to situations that are challenging really uh, that uh, uh, have uh, starting points in the communication on a daily basis but translate into complexity in the decision making. And Dr. Bimali, who was here, I don't know if she's here right now, would also be able to comment on that. Uh, so this is a situation where an entire team needs to continuously be tuned up to patient's preferences and uh, keep that in mind, you know, example being, yes, you can have your dog, um, you know, two months uh, after transplantation on the patty, but you must not lick your dog because you're immunosuppressed. So it's a very um, fine line to walk, <laughs> and uh, we have learned a lot. As far as, as, far as hepatitis C and uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, around 10%, actually 8% of, of adults with congenital heart disease have hepatitis C. Um, you know, these people had operations in the 70s and the 80s, so it's something I think we should be checking for routinely on all adult congenital patients. Hepatocellular carcinoma. If they've been operated or not? If, if they've been operated, I'm sorry, yes. If they, my bad, if they've been operated. Um, but uh, the other thing is hepatocellular carcinoma. This, this has been hitting us now multiple times a year where these poor people are showing up with, with liver tumors and we had a young man with a primary effusion lymphoma of his acidic fluid and uh, just terrible, terrible outcomes. And I think uh, that is something that we should be looking for. And that's where those liver scans um, that we've been doing can be helpful. Um, what, what do you guys think, would you? All right, so we're, we'll hopefully shift gears a little bit now. This is um, a patient with Eisenmenger physiology in pregnancy. So she's 23 with tetralogy of Fallot and pulmonary atresia and aeropulmonary collaterals. She had banding of a large AP collateral at the age of three months and was offered unifocalization at that time. Um, the family was Spanish speaking only. I think there were some language barriers and they were very reluctant to pursue surgery. So the family uh, refused and she was lost to follow up after declining surgery. In 2005, we saw her uh, for the first time in our clinic, and she reported more cyanosis and dyspnea. We performed cardiopulmonary exercise testing at that time, and her maximum oxygen consumption was 17.9 mils per cake per minute, which is 43% of predicted. It's quite low. Uh, we asked to see her back in a couple of months. She was lost to follow up again, and now she presents uh, 22 weeks pregnant. So. She says that she did not know how severe her condition was, and no one had ever spoken to her about pregnancy. She can walk one block, uh, which is about her baseline, and she's limited by dyspnea. She's had no prenatal care, because 
per the patient, no one was willing to see her because she was high risk. She would like to continue the pregnancy and is not on any medications. So we're in quite a bind here. Her exam uh, is significant for a saturation of 78% on room air. She has a lot of the physical exam findings of cyanotic heart disease. Um, she has conjunctival suffusion. She has spongy gums, a prominent A wave and her jugular venous pulsation, which goes along with right ventricular hypertrophy and um, restrictive RV physiology. She has clear lungs with a loud continuous murmur heard bilaterally, which goes along with her collaterals. Her cardiac exam shows an RV lift. She has a, a loud and single S2 and then a loud continuous murmur on the right. She had severe clubbing and trace edema. So one thing I would, I'm sorry, I, I would just interject. I, I think it's, it's, it's tough to say that this patient has Eisenmenger syndrome, right? Because it's, it, it, she has con a continuous murmur. So you know that at least some segments of the pulmonary circulation are low resistance, low pressure. The uh, problem here that we have with a lot of these patients with unrepaired uh, pulmonary atresia with multiple aorta pulmonary collaterals is that some segments of the lung are very hypertensive where there is unobstructed pulmonary blood flow, others where they've either naturally banded themselves or they've been banded surgically, maybe low pressure. So you get this sort of heterogeneous pattern within the lungs of certain areas that are under high pressure, high resistance, certain areas that are protected. Um, and so I, I would just, the one thing I would be hesitant of is just stating that this is Eisenmenger syndrome. I think we could take a lot of criticism as far as, because, because this is not classic Eisenmenger's complex, um, but she's certainly cyanotic and she certainly has pulmonary hypertension in certain segments. So uh, that would be uh, just one sort of uh, definition um, criticism. Good point. Um, so she has uh, signs of cyanosis as well as her, on her labs. She had a hemoglobin of 23, uh, milligram, milligrams per deciliter, a hematocrit of 57, and a platelet count of 109. And this is her echocardiogram. You can see that she has quite good left ventricular uh, systolic function. There's a non-restrictive ventricular septal defect with bidirectional shunting. And her right ventricle is hypertrophied, but it has pretty good systolic function, and that's reassuring. So I'd like to turn to the panel. This is a woman now at 22 weeks pregnancy. She's had no prenatal care. And what is, our, what is her sort of estimated maternal and fetal risk uh, sh should she continue this pregnancy? I mean, the first thing, ignore the Eisenmenger's, I agree with Jamil. You, we don't know what her pressures are in various segments of the lung, but what he said has been routinely the, the, the case in these unrepaired folks. We find some areas unprotected, they're hypertensive, they've got vascular disease, others are, have been protected and they have low, low, low PA pressures, which also complicates in the few I've been involved with using um, pulmonary vasodilators because some of them just don't feel well for some reason. I don't know if Jamil agrees with that or not, but it, it hasn't been uniformly as useful in, as in true Eisenhower. The first thing though, um, um, and the other, th you know, a lot of people glom on the functional class when they judge whether or not pregnancy is advisable. Remember, NYHA has little to do with this disease. You didn't say anything about it, but I'm just saying, a lot of people will try and classify these guys as the New York Heart Association, and that's really designed more for sort of the patient with angina and heart failure than it is for somebody who's cyanotic like this who has totally abnormal ventilatory mechanics and, and distribution of cyanotic blood. So the number one thing I can say is that uh, well documented, at least in one pretty good study, if not more, is the level of the uh, oxygen saturation. And what you can say is the fetal risk here, I'm not sure I have the percentage right, but the fetal risk of, of, of prematurity is very high, possibly before 32 weeks. And secondly, the fetal mortality rate, if I remember correctly from those studies, if you're down in the 70s, is over 25% of, oh, you're going to do it. For yeah, I'm just going to pull this up. Okay. So this is just the one reference I think is very useful. This is from Circulation 1994 uh, by Presbytero. This is a study that Dr. Child's mentioning. Um, they looked at uh, a large series of women with cyanotic heart disease who are pregnant. There's overall 30 to 50 percent chance of maternal cardiovascular complications with volume overload and arrhythmias predominating, and that tends to be the case for most women uh, with congenital heart disease who uh, have issues during pregnancy. And I think the one thing is, is what is the effect of cyanosis on fetal risk? 
With a hemoglobin of over 20, this woman's was 23, there's an 8% live birth rate. A maternal saturation of less than 85% is associated with a 12% live birth rate. Um, and then uh, there's a very high risk of premature delivery, 15%, and a 50% risk of spontaneous abortion. So uh, I will say this, though. These are very grim numbers, but um, my experience tells me that, that we don't have anywhere near this complication rate, either maternal or fetal in the modern era, especially with the use of pulmonary vasodilators and, and um, you know, in, in uh, uh, centers where there's high-risk OB that's available and, and these patients are, are uh, sort of taken care of throughout the pregnancy very diligently. Uh, this woman is not in fluid heart failure or ventricular function, although her RV is large and um, the function, certainly systolic function is not normal. Her function was not terrible here. Um, and so uh, I think that, that this data from Breast Otero and Somerville um, from a series that was really collected in the late 80s and published in the early 90s um, is grimmer than what we see these days. I, obviously, I would not encourage this woman to get pregnant, but she came to us 22 weeks pregnant. What's, what's the greater danger, to let her continue the pregnancy or try to do a, a late uh, uh, abortion here? And, and she wanted to keep the child. And I can say in, in our experience over the last few years, and, and I know, you know John's been involved with a lot of these patients, as, as have you guys and, and Pam and Linda and, and Jeanette, and you know, we have not had, knock on wood, uh, uh, mortality in the last five, six years with Eisenmenger's patients who've gotten pregnant. We've had some patients that we've managed with remodulin during pregnancy, with sildenafil during pregnancy. We've had complications during pregnancy, preterm labor being the major one, and issues of bleeding, but this risk of death after delivery that is so high, we just have not really seen that um, in real practice. Thank you. Just a quick mention, uh, she also needs a fetal echocardiogram. Yes, I'll mention that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, uh, I also wanted to mention there's a risk of intrauterine growth retardation, small for gestational size babies. I just also wanted to mention that there is a risk stratification system, and this doesn't, I don't think that this patient would really fall into this category because of her severe cyanosis, but just wanted to mention there's a paper, um, a couple papers, that this is the um, study that was for congenital patients in circulation in 2006. And they risk stratified patients using arrhythmia or prior cardiac event, New York Heart Association, class three or four, or cyanosis, systemic ventricle obstruction, or a subaortic ventricular ejection fraction of less than 40%. And um, if they had one predictor, their risk went from about 10% to 30%, and two or more risk factors um, gave them almost 100% risk of a maternal complication. Um, so we put together a labor and delivery plan because we ex uh, extensively counseled her and she really wanted to keep the pregnancy. We recommended that she obtain a fetal echocardiogram. This is generally done around 18 to 22 weeks. And we wanted her to get an echo and an exam in the second and third trimesters to ensure that she had stable RV function. We anticipated no cardiac contraindication to vaginal delivery, although we did recommend antibiotics at rupture of membranes due to the presence of a ventricular septal defect. Um, we recommended telemetry, and then I wanted to mention this right here, bubble filters on all IVs. Anyone with a, a right, to, you know, right to left shunt um, should have particle filters on all IVs to prevent systemic embolization. So this is what actually happened. Uh, her fetal echocardiogram was normal. Uh, we informed her, and she wanted to continue the pregnancy. We started pulmonary vasodilators with sildenafil 10 milligrams uh, three times a day, which we often do in this setting. And she tolerated that well, but at 34 weeks came in with HELP syndrome, which is unexpected. She had an emergency C-section, and the baby's APGARs uh, were 3, 5, 7, and 7, um, with a low birth weight of 1780 grams, which we often see. Um, but actually, she flew through delivery and did just fine in the postpartum period. The baby eventually went home, and um, we did give her adequate contraception. Um, with an implanon device. Um, this is a progesterone-only device, which is uh, safe in these patients. Any additional comments from our panel? I just mentioned that uh, the baby's APGARs were actually slightly lower, more because the maternal general anesthesia. 
it was not an epidural anesthesia, so the baby was depressed, not because the baby was preterm or had suffered significant complications from the maternal congenital heart disease, it was that she was administered uh, inhaled anesthetic, and once we were able to bag the baby a little bit from, um, I was taking care of both patients, I guess, um, we were able to, to clear the inhaled anesthetic from the baby, and the baby pepped up really quickly. Uh, would anybody have considered an MRI or some sort of a study to look at her pulmonary anatomy, pulmonary artery vasculature? You mean during the pregnancy? During the pregnancy. Um, well, I, I'll be honest with you. Unless, unless it's going to change what we're going to do, um, I wouldn't uh, put her through an MRI with having a lysopine for you know, a good 35, 40 minutes for a good quality study. And then gadolinium in pregnancy is an issue there. Uh, and you know, what am I going to do with the data? Am I going to go and, and stent some of these collaterals open if they're narrowed? Am I going to plug up collaterals? I, I, in all truth, MRI is fantastic, but I just don't know how it would have changed anything that I would have done in this patient you know, for this pregnancy. I think echo, BNP, seeing her on a regular basis, making sure we keep her volume under control, making sure that uh, um, you know, her functionally she's not deteriorating. Um, uh, that was where we sort of put most of our effort um, as opposed to further imaging of her pulmonary arterial circulation. That's certainly something that we can do going forward if she would be interested in any kind of reparative procedure. You're right. But I think during the pregnancy, I, I, uh, I saw her when she first came at 22 weeks and, and in follow-up again. I just I, I didn't think it was going to change what, what we did. Would, uh, would anybody have considered a cardiac catheterization? I know that's very aggressive, but would anybody consider a cardiac catheterization to check her PA pressures to, stratis to stratify her based on pulmonary hypertension versus just cyanosis, severe pulmonary hypertension? Uh, well, so re recall what she has is, is pulmonary atresia with a large VST and an RV that's pumping against systemic pressures. So in my mind, the key to pulmonary hypertension is really in the subpulmonic ventricle that is pumping to that circulation. And in this particular case, you have an LV and an RV that are pumping into a systemic circulation with multiple AP collaterals <clears throat> supplying the pulmonary arterial bed. So it's, you know, again, it's, it's to me, it's a, it's a, a long climb uh, to, to sort of quote John Child, who uses this all the time. It would be a long climb for a short slide and without a huge amount of benefit as far as changing the therapies. I love sildenafil, not because it's Viagra and, and I need it. I, should, I, said, I said I love sildenafil, then I thought about that for a second. So you, so, could so you clarify like, that? I was talking about pediatric versus adult congenital heart disease, and I said children are just sexier. <laughs> and then people said, oh, I meant for the press. Uh, but but the, the, the reason I really like sildenafil in these patients is that Number one, we have samples and we can give them, we can give them 10 milligrams right there in clinic. Right there, it's just here you go, take this and stand around for the next 40 minutes, hang around clinic and let's just see how you tolerate the pulmonary vasodilator. Um, and we've been doing a lot more of that with these cases where it's not clear. You know, some Fontaine patient, and, and in this particular case, you know, a cardiac cath wouldn't have changed me attempting to give her uh, a pulmonary vasodilator. She actually benefited, benefited from that. She, she felt better on the sildenafil. So uh, I would not have cathed her. Anybody have cathed her? Joe? No. <laughs> we'll, we'll move on then. Oh. Actually, I, I think if it's OK with you guys, we are now at 11.50, well, why don't we do it? We'll do one more case. We'll do one more case, and then we'll break it. All right, so um, these are two cases of patients who have been palliated, who fall within the spectrum of Eisenmeiger physiology that we discussed before. The uh, first woman is a 36-year-old uh, female with tricuspid atresia, pulmonary atresia, a non-restrictive VSD and ASD. She had a Waterston shunt that connected her ascending uh, aorta to the right pulmonary artery around age uh, three, 
and she had um, uh, pulmonary hypertension that precluded her from moving on to uh, the Glenar Fontan. Uh, she had had multiple episodes of hemoptysis for many years uh, that presented initially with uh, chest pain and cough and then um, uh, blood tinge sputum. Uh, when she came in uh, this particular time, she was afebrile, she had a heart rate in the 80s, uh, her blood pressure was good, and her saturations were about 87% on room air. Um, at baseline, she ranged between 85 to 89%, so we didn't see any uh, major change there. She was uh, mildly dyspneic. Her uh, JVP was not up. Uh, she had some crackles at her right base, and she had her continuous uh, shunt murmur from the Waterston shunt. She happened to be given a course of azithromycin before we saw her for, for presumed community-acquired pneumonia from the crackles, and uh, she subsequently developed worsening chest pain, uh, mild hemoptysis in the form of just some blood-tinged sputum, um, and then presented to the emergency de department where we saw um, a chest CT was performed um, before we uh, came in for consultation. So here you can see the Waterston shunt sort of connecting over, and she has some organization of uh, in situ thrombus in there as well. The uh, next MRI show, picture here showed an infarct, a wedge-shaped infarct, where the uh, thrombus had uh, uh, collected and, and sort of blocked off the lung there. I'm now going to show you a, a, a similar case um, of a patient with a POTS um, anastomosis and show you how different the two cases are and then sort of ask the panel how they might manage each one of them. So the second woman is uh, 42 years old. She has tricuspid atresia and pulmonary stenosis. She had a POTS anastomosis at five months of age, which is connecting the descending aorta to the left pulmonary artery. She had um, an in situ thrombus in the LPA, and she has frequent complaints of chest pain. Here we have an axial um, uh, picture of the uh, POTS shunt connecting over here to the LPA, and then a very large calcified um, uh, thrombus in the LPA. On the AP picture, it's pretty profound here, um, taking up most of uh, the uh, LPA down to the lower segments of the lung. So the question for the panel is, and, and maybe Dr. Perloff can also expound on, you know, what happens in Eisenmenger uh, sort of type physiology, why these patients develop in situ thrombus, um, their sort of clotting issues, and then what the best treatment for these two patients are. I think one of the struggles we find in patients who have these <coughs> clotting issues is whether or not they would benefit from uh, anticoagulation uh, to protect the remaining uh, lung or if they should just be left alone so that they can um, uh, continue with what they have. They should be left alone. <coughs> these thrombotic interests so long ago I can't recall. We even tried um, intravascular uh, infu uh, infusions of anticoagulants. Nothing touches them. Uh, all one can do is increase the risk of the drug itself. But I can tell you in my experience, uh, this is a catastrophe waiting to happen. These thrombi, it's not clear why they develop. And they can be absolutely enormous. Uh, the size of the pulmonary arteries, either the right or left, uh, not the pulmonary trunk as a rule, uh, can, be, can reach astonishing uh, degrees of uh, devotation. Uh, the thrombi uh, are there, and I, in, in my experience, uh, it's simply uh, a problem one has to confront with anticipation of uh, uh, disaster. But there is nothing that I'm aware of. I remember the first time John Chow perhaps recalls as well, the patient in which we infused heparin into the site, nothing that we did had any effect at all. So we had one, we tried thrombolysis, and all it did was give him an arterial to arterial uh, embolus. Yeah. It went from proximal to distal. So, Just moved it downstream. But, but, but it didn't get rid of the, the main thrombus. Uh, but I think there are situations where, you know, you have in situ thrombi versus migration of thrombus from, for example, in that Waterston patient, right, where you had um, 
yeah, an, an acute an limbus. acute event. But it's an arterial arterial embolus. Yeah, no, right, right. But uh, but an acute event versus a chronic yeah. thrombus. I no, I'm talking about during an acute event we yeah. try intraarterial yeah. thrombolysis. No. And we simply cause more of that sort of arterial arterial embolus. Yeah, I, I don't think we ended up giving her thrombolysis, but I, th I think she ended up on anticoagulation because we found, we felt that it was a an acute event that, mm -hmm. and she's tolerated it since. But the other one with that. You know, inside to thrombus and, and um, the way that El Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a real issue because it, it, it's one, it may be one thing if you have somebody who's never had hemopsis. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. fine, maybe. But if you have somebody who says has a recurrent history of hemopsis, right. you're, you may now cause them to have more massive hemopsis, which sometimes it doesn't have to be hemopsis, it can just be intrapulmonary hemorrhage, which can be their death. I mean, they can asphyxiate from it. And in fact, I mean, if I then, if somebody pressed me and said, well, okay, they've had, oh, so, oh, so they had one hemopsis and it wasn't much, and I didn't see a lot of pulmonary hemorrhage. If I were gonna choose, I probably would not choose aspirin based on studies Dr. Perloff did years ago. Uh, about 85% of these folks have problems with their large von Willebr Willebrand multimers plus platelet defects and so on. So if I was gonna choose some, I'd probably choose Coumadin, not, not a, an antiplatelet agent. Yeah. So. And I think the issue with the, with the new antithrombins uh, like Prodaxa uh, and Sorelto is, is that um, you can't reverse it. So, yeah. you know, you're, if a don't patient like that. this opens up and starts bleeding, then you're really stuck. Um, yeah, you don't want to do that. FFP, vitamin K isn't going to touch it. So, um, you know, I, I would choose warfarin yeah. for case A, but probably nothing for case B. Yeah. Yeah, it's Actually, a, I'd like to ask if, if just because I'm, I'm looking at this LPA thrombus here, and, and then I'm looking at Dr. Rothman, and I'm thinking about <laughs> his, I'm thinking about his pigs, uh, and he has a, a fantastic uh, model for shunt-mediated pulmonary hypertension by essentially creating a POTS shunt, restricted POTS shunt in um, a swine model, and from the angels that I've seen that you've shown me, my God, they look just like this. Um, yeah. What? What, what are you doing for the animals? Do you anticoagulate them? Have you studied that at all? Yeah, we do, um, we do more for them now. We used to do aspirin before, and uh, we had more cloth, and now we have less cloth, now we're putting it. So I think it's a combination of essentially getting the field of dysfunction from the, you know, from the hypertension, from the increased flow, and also we get this post synodic rotation just like this. We create this LPA shunt from the aorta just like this, and you get this post synodic dilatation. I think you you have stasis and flow and also in the field of dysfunction. And this is the place where we uh, see the thromba. But we've used Coumadin and we've seen a lot less thrombus in the uh, animals uh, as opposed to aspirin. And, and have you noted much in the way of, of bleeding, hemoptysis, issues with, I mean, you know, we wouldn't want yeah, to translate from... Now that isn't a chronic, this animal hasn't been around for 20 and 30 That's years. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, what, I mean we don't see, you don't see people get these pot shunts then the next year they got hemopsis. Yeah. This is something that 20 years later, now they start having problems with massive hemopsis. So it, it, I, you'd have to have a model that does it. But the other thing is, what you'll see clearly is there's calcium throughout the, the wall of this thing. And the ones that Dr. Fishbein's done, they often have an atherosclerotic looking change. So they've got to have vascular dysfunction. And as you said, then you get swirl. Because we've seen some, some people with enormous aneurysmal things and the thrombus is layered. You know, it doesn't project out in most of them like this thing does. It's just layered and it's filling in the, you know, the vascular aneurysm, if you will. Uh, down, down, down the road, some of these people have gotten these aneurysms so big that they'll compress them, usually on the right, they'll compress a main stem bronchus and that'll be another big issue, you know. Anyway, so yeah, it's very interesting, thank you. So uh, since we're winding down with time, I'll just tell you the, the results for, the, for these two patients. The first patient that we discussed, she was actually an inpatient when we started some Coumadin. Um, she actually had some improvement um, uh, with her uh, oxygenation and also just her, her, her general feeling of well-being. She hasn't had any bleeding episodes since that time. Mm -hmm. The second patient here, when she had her episode of acute chest pain, the only interval change on her um, uh, CT was this uh, small portion of infarct in the uh, pulmonary area right here. Um, and so again, we didn't feel that her, uh, her clot burden was already so high that we weren't going to get any benefit out of anticoagulation. <coughs>
So no, we, we, do, we do have... <laughs> we have a lot of patients like that, actually. We, we, we do have a case that I think uh, Dr. Palutla may be presenting tomorrow where we did have the growth of a main pulmonary artery aneurysm from about 5 centimeters to 11 centimeters or something like that over, over a six-year period. And, and we, we felt that there was such a risk, actually, of... It was a, a woman with detransposition. We felt that there was such a risk of this aneurysm rupturing that um, we ended up actually offering her a hybrid surgical procedure. She had very complex anatomy, PSPR, but a subpulmonic but, LV. But she didn't have pulmonary hypertension, she right? Had to, yeah, she had a PVR of uh, 20 wood units. Oh, I'm and, thinking very and, a very, and a very large PA aneurysm. And, and, uh, Is that the one who also compressed the left main? No, that's a, that's a different one. This okay, one I'm had no left main compression. But, but what this one had, we were able to actually open up the aneurysm uh, Dr. Lax uh, um, fixed the aneurysm and we ended up replacing the valve in a hybrid fashion using a melody valve that was implanted upside down essentially in the native RVOT or in this case it was the LVOT because it was a subpulmonic LV. So I think there are cases where we will do those sorts of things but you know it's... Um, I was thinking of the wrong person, but let me throw out. You look at the CT and there's diffuse calcification through those walls. You've got issues in trying to sew into that stuff in somebody who's got pulmonary hypertension and cyanosis. So the other thing, remember these people have been chronically cyanotic for 30 years. You, have a, you must have seen these when you go in on adults. They have diffuse vascular congestion, dilatation, much, often more bleeding, difficult to control. You have to have a real good reason to want to go in and operate on that aneurysm, and then you got to know how you're going to get out of there. So. Great. I mean, our natural impulse is we want to do something, right? Well, I was thinking maybe the second round. Oh. You say it? Because if you calcify that, maybe you should go Well, I'd counsel against it, but I've been wrong before. <laughs> I, wasn't it 79 that I was wrong? <laughs> 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 Must have been way before that. Yeah. Oh, man, that's right. It was 69. That's right. I thought I was wrong at that time, but I was later proven right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, everybody's participation.